Okay, welcome again to Hillside Community Church in Juniata. We're glad that you're joining us. Uh, it's hard to believe but we've been doing this since March. Um, and uh, we're probably going to be doing this for quite a while, even, even now. Uh, at least in our area, if you're listening from somewhere else in the U.S., uh, COVID cases are up. Uh, people are becoming even more hesitant to come out in person. And so we're taking advantage of our opportunities to put messages online and hopefully that God continues to use his word in your life uh, as you understand it and put it into practice. So continuing our series on 2 Corinthians, the series theme is strength and weakness. Just have a few weeks left and then Christmas will be here. Um, hopefully you have a great Thanksgiving next week as well. Again, all that stuff's impacted by what's going on around us and uh, uh, we're just glad that you were able to join with us. Our title today is Hard to Swallow. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 16. Hard to Swallow is the title. We'll have a word of prayer. And we'll look at this, uh, this subject, which I'm sure is relevant to everybody. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for Paul. I thank you for recording uh, what you did in his life to change him, how you used him in missionary journeys, how you used him to plant churches, how you used him to write your word. And uh, as we go through 2 Corinthians, I pray that you would continue to challenge us, teach us, help us to be accurate. I pray the Holy Spirit is the one who leads, changes, empowers, uh, and works in our lives through this. And we just thank you for the privilege to be part of your family, the privilege to serve you. And I pray you would use this word, this message, and I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to start with a picture of the province of Alberta. If you're not familiar with uh, Canada... Uh, we lived in British Columbia, the westernmost province, but beside British Columbia there was the next province called Alberta. And one year at our Bible school, we had a girl from Alberta, a native lady, a little older. She had two, two boys. Uh, she's a single mom. Came to the school to study. When she went back to home to her home reserve, just north of Calgary, uh, she wanted to have an area Bible school. So she asked if I would come and teach that. And so I went to teach. And one of the nights when I was there, I was having a meal with the family. Uh, but you have a picture of that, uh, that meal in front of you. I don't know what kind of meat it was. I'm not sure. Uh, it was something wild. It was something I'd never eaten before. And it was hard to swallow. It was hard to swallow. Kept chewing, trying to work through it. Maybe you've been in that kind of situation. Happened to me again one time in Honduras where they gave some very chewy beef. They rarely get beef in Honduras. Oh boy, it was tough. Uh, to swallow. And another thing that's hard to swallow is criticism. Criticism. Anytime you're in any kind of position of leadership, you're going to face criticism. The truth is, all of us have been criticized. Uh, some of us have been helpful, some of us have not been helpful. And all of us have been people who've criticized other people. Paul's being criticized in the book of 2 Corinthians. A lot of times, you really don't even have to answer criticism. Many times I haven't. But there are times I have. And Paul does here, and he does so because he's concerned. His biggest concern, he's going to say in chapter 11, was this. He said, um, Just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. He said, I'm afraid that you might be led astray from your severe devotion to Christ. False teachers had come in. They lied about Paul. They criticized Paul. They came in with their own credentials, commending themselves. And Paul, although he was not able to be there, now answers them so that people are not led astray. And next week we're going to look at chapter 11, because behind all of this, Satan is at work. But today in chapter 10, we're going to look at the whole concept of hard to swallow. The truth is, we see criticism throughout the Bible. In the Old Testament, we saw Moses in Numbers chapter 11. His brother Aaron and his sister Miriam criticized him. Here's what it says. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife. For he had married a Cushite. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked? Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. Keep in mind, when you criticize, God hears what you're saying. Now, we won't get into the story in, in Numbers, but uh, God dealt with Aaron and Miriam. Miriam ended up with leprosy for seven days because of her criticism of Moses. Um, Second Corinthians chapter 10, we're going to look at criticism. We're going to look at what the critics said about Paul. We're going to begin in verse 1. The first thing they said about Paul was, you are a 
hypocrite. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. He says, By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you, I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold went away. Use a little sarcasm here. I beg you that when I come, I, not, I may not have to be bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. Notice he says, I appeal to you, I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold went away. We mean a hypocrite. Hypocrite comes from a Greek word, which means to be a play actor. Actually, it's people who communicated from behind a mask. And they were saying, Paul, in presence, he's a weakling. In his letters, he's bold and pushy and bossy. And uh, so they said he was one thing in his letters, he was a different thing in presence. Um, he, he, later on, he's going to say, listen, I want you to realize that what I am in my letters, that's what we're going to be in presence. I don't know if you've ever been criticized of being a hypocrite, of being overbearing, of being one thing and, and then being accused of being another thing. That's what Paul was going through here. And, it, and so he, he's going to answer that in a minute. The second thing they accuse him of is verse 2. Uh, he says in verse 2, I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. He said Paul was worldly. Greek word used there is fleshly. Uh, Paul used it in 1 Corinthians when he talks about the Corinthians who hadn't matured in their walk with Christ. They were walking according to the flesh. They were not maturing and growing. And he says here, some people say that we live by the standards of the world. Literally it says walking by. The Greek word used there means to walk, but it's used in general of a person's lifestyle. And he says you live by the standards of this world. You worldly. Um, in chapter 1, verse 17, he even deals with this early on in the book when he says this, For Christ did not send me to baptize him, so I have 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I want to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, he says this, When I plan this, did I do it lightly? Do I make my plans in a worldly manner, so that in the same breath I say yes, yes, and no, no? In other words, they said, Paul, you said you were going to do this, but then you changed your mind. He's going to explain why he changed his mind, but he said, I do not make my plans based upon worldly things. In chapter 1, verse 12, he said this, Our conscience testifies that we've conducted ourselves in the world, especially in our relations with you, in the holiness and sincerity that are in Christ. He said, I didn't do anything worldly. I came in the power of God. In chapter three, 6, he said, We put no stumbling block in anyone's path, so our ministry would not be discredited. We didn't do anything that would be a stumbling block to others. In chapter 7, he says, We've wronged no one, we've corrupted no one, we've exploited no one. He did not do his ministry in the power of the human flesh. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says this, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, which would be a worldly approach, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Paul said, My ministry, done amongst you, was done in the power of the Holy Spirit, not in the flesh, not by human ability. And he goes on here in chapter 10, verse 2. If you look at verse 3, here's what he says. He's, verse 2, and this way, do you think that we live by the standards of this world? Verse 3 says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. What's he talking about? Well, look at verse 4. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every presentation that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. Paul says, not only do we not live by the world, we don't war by the world. We're going to look at this more next week. But keep this in mind. We are in a constant spiritual war. The enemy will do anything he can to distract believers, divide churches, uh, mislead, uh, and... Paul says, when we're in a battle, we don't fight with human weapons. We fight with weapons that are powerful weapons. To take all these thoughts that these false teachers are spreading, 
all these false ideas and destroy them, take them captive. Paul says, no, I'm not a hypocrite, and we're not using worldly weapons in this war. We're not living according to the world. Look at verses 7, 8, and 9. Jump down to 7. He says, you're not looking only on the surface of things. Here, they're going to accuse him of being bossy. Verse 7, you're not looking, you're only looking on the surface of things. If anyone is confident that he belongs to Christ, he should consider again that we belong to Christ just as much as he. For even though I boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord has given us for building you up rather than pulling you down, I will not be ashamed of it. I do not want to seem to be trying to frighten you with my letters. Verse 10 says, Some people say his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he's unimpressive, and speaking amounts to nothing. Hey, he said, said, some said he was bossy. Look at verse 8. Even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord gave us for building you up. God is the one who put Paul there. God's the one who made Paul an apostle. The apostles had authority. They had the ability to challenge people, to confront people. They're saying he's being too bossy. They resented Paul's authority as an apostle. They wanted that position. Uh, it says in chapter 1, verse 24, Not that we lord it over your faith. Paul wasn't trying to be bossy. He was trying to, well, he's going to explain that in a minute. He's trying to build them up, lead them into the faith, help them go in a walk with Christ. A number of years ago in, in the ministry at Hillside Community Church, I was accused of a similar thing. I was, someone told me I was a dictator. I was a dictator. Um, Paul said, you, these people said to Paul, you're just too bossy. Paul says, listen, I have authority, but God gave me that authority. And, and I'm trying to use that authority to help you in your relationship with Christ. And then in verse 10, they get really mean here. In verse 10, they say he's unimpressive. Look at verse 10 again. It says, um, some say his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he's unimpressive. The Greek word is weak, and his speaking amounts to nothing. Verse 11 says, such people should realize what we are in our letters when we are absent. We will be in our actions when we are present. He's unimpressive. Unimpressive. Physically unimpressive. Again, that's the worldly way of evaluating things. We, we, what was in the Old Testament when David was made king? Samuel looked at his brother and said, wow, he's tall, good looking. He must be the one. God said, no, he's not the one. People look at the outward. God looks at the heart. And so David was chosen based upon his heart. God chose Paul not based on his physical attributes, but on his heart and passion for God. Now, there's no way of confirming 100% what Paul looked like, uh, but someone wrote in the 2nd century this about Paul's appearance. It said, it's conjectured as being reported that there was no basis in fact. He was described as an ugly little Jew, short, bald, bow-legged, with bowed, sh bowed shoulders, and a crooked nose. Not impressive, as far as our world stands are concerned. Um, what's he say in chapter 4? I'm just a clay jar. Power comes from God. Obviously, if God worked through a short, bald Jewish man, uh, that it wasn't his power, it wasn't his, abil his ability. It's obviously God working through that person. Weak, clay jar. Remember, God looks at the heart, not at the exterior. But these false teachers that came in, they went on externals. They went on letters of recommendation. Not only that, they finally also said in verse 10, you're a poor speaker. You're a poor preacher. It says this, his speaking amounts to nothing. What happened with the false teachers? They came in, they were trained speakers. He's going to say in chapter 11, uh, verse 6, I may not be a trained speaker, but I do have knowledge. Paul wasn't a trained speaker. We do know one thing, the book of Acts, that's almost humorous. One thing about Paul. He did put a young man to sleep one time when he was preaching. Uh, in uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Uh, he was in the city of Troas. And uh, on the first day of the week, they got together to break bread. And Paul spoke to the people. And because he intended to leave the next day, he kept on talking until midnight. I don't know if you've been through long sermons or not, but Paul went on a long time. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Seated in the window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. Listen, we've all, if you've spoken, you realize sometimes you lose people and sometimes people fade away. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and picked up dead. 
Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Went upstairs again and broke bread. And after talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home and were greatly comforted. Okay, Paul said, I'm not a trained speaker. Hey, but listen, God used Paul to write the New Testament books. Paul was a great theologian. He wrote great letters. Maybe he wasn't the top trained speaker, but God used Paul in powerful ways uh, to impact the lives of many people. See, a generalized problem with all criticism is this. People who criticize don't know the whole story. They don't know all the facts. They make assumptions. A grocery store clerk one time wrote to advice columnist Ann Landers to complain that she'd seen people buying luxury food items like birthday cakes and bags of shrimp with their food stamps. The writer went on to say that she thought all those people in welfare who treated themselves to such necessities were lazy and wasteful. A few weeks later, people responded. One lady spoke, wrote in, I, I didn't buy a cake, but I did buy a big bag of shrimp with food stamps. So what? She said, my husband has been working at a plant for 15 years when it shut down. The shrimp casserole I made was for our wedding anniversary dinner, and it lasted for three days. Perhaps, she said, the grocery clerk who criticized would have a different view of life after walking a mile in my shoes. Another one who bought the cake wrote this. She said, I did buy the cake for $17, and I paid for it with food stamps. I thought the checkout woman was going to burn a hole through me as I stood there in line. What she didn't know was this cake was it for my daughter, who's young and has cancer. And this, she said, would be her last birthday cake. Again, people who criticize often criticize and they make assumptions. They don't know all the facts. And so if you're the one doing the criticism, please keep that in mind. If you're the one being criticized, also keep that in mind. So how did Paul respond to all of this? How did Paul respond? First of all, he corrected their perspective. In verse 7, Here's what he says. You are looking only on the surface of things. See, that, that, that addresses what we just talked about. If you only look on the surface, you don't know. You don't know what people's motives are. We assume certain motives, but we don't know that for sure. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says in chapter 4, God's going to one day reveal even our motives. False teachers came in with the wrong kind of motives. Paul had pure motives. He was there, but people criticized him. And so he tried to correct their thinking. He said, you're only looking on the surface of things. And that's why people often criticize. They don't look deeply enough. They haven't peered below the surface. But there's also an application to the person being criticized. Before you take offense at a reproachful remark, take a look at this yourself from the perspective of the person who's making the criticism. You may still disagree, but understanding the other point of view may take some sting out of the statement. Early on in our ministry, I was asked to visit a man in the hospital. He did not attend our church, but his daughter attended the church. When I walked into his room, here's the first thing he said to me. He said, I don't like you people or your church or what you've done to my daughter. Oh, 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 how are you doing? I explained that we had advisors. There was an issue going on between this daughter and her parents. And we had advisors to sit down with her parents and work through the issue. He made an assumption that we had actually told her, hey, you do this thing, you don't have to listen to your parents, whatever. Um, by the time I left, he actually shook my hand and thanked me for coming. All I did was try to correct his perspective. And so Paul tries to correct the perspective. Listen, you only look on the surface of things. You haven't looked deeply enough. And that's often the mistake people make. Secondly, he stated his motives. Look at verse 8 and 9. Here's what he says. For even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority of the Lord gave us for building you up rather than pulling you down, I will not be ashamed of it. I do not want to seem to be trying to frighten you with my letters. Because some people say his letters are weighty and forceful in person. He's unimpressive and is speaking amounts to nothing. Such people should realize what we are in our letters when we are absent. We will be in our actions when we are present. What did Paul say his motive was? To build them up. Paul took no money from these people at all. He served there for a year and a half. Never was a burden to anyone. It's amazing to me that these people so quickly turned against Paul. Just because false teachers came in and fabricated all these stories. What did he do? He corrected their perspective and then he stated his motive. And it's really hard to determine someone's motive. When you criticize, you need to keep in mind... You really don't know what the motive of that person is. Again, people assume, 
know what, why you do what you do. And so what Paul was trying to do is help them understand what his real motive was. I graduated high school in 1960. I was 18 years old when I graduated. That year, the draft was big because of Vietnam. And uh, they were picking numbers based on the number you could be called at any time to go. I also felt that year that God was leading me to Bible college. And in fact, I hadn't even known about a Bible college until I was 17 at a Bible study I went to. A young man showed up and said he came from Washington Bible College. And God laid it on my heart to go to Washington Bible College that year. But a woman in our church, small church I grew up in, spread the rumor that I went to Bible College so I wouldn't be drafted. That hurt. She did not know my motives. The truth is, I didn't even have a student deferment. The reason why I did was not drafted because I had a very high number. Criticism. Oh, Ken Beekler, he only went to Bible college because he didn't want to go into the service. Third thing Paul did was he reminded them of the facts. He reminded them of the facts. Look at verse 11, chapter 10. Such people should realize what we are in our letters. When we're absent, we will be in our actions when we're present. Paul says, I, I've always been the same. I haven't been one thing in my letters, a different thing in present. You know that. What we are in our letters, we're going to be when we come there. And one of the reasons he wrote his letters and, and challenged them, so that when he did come, he didn't have to be that harsh. He's going to say that in chapter 13. Verse 12, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond proper limits, but will confine our boasting to the field God has assigned to us, a field that reaches even to you. Listen, you know we came there. You know what we did there. You know what God has done there. You know how we invested in you. We are not going too far in our boasting, as would be the case if we had not come to you, for we did get as far as you with the gospel of Christ. Neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting the work done by others. We're not boasting on other people's work. In chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, it says, Listen, I laid a foundation, other people build upon that foundation. Each man's going to be held accountable for how he builds. Paul reminded of the fact, what we are in a letter, we are in person. God's the one who gave him this ministry. He didn't force himself on the Corinthians. His reason for coming to Corinth was to bring the gospel. And dozens of people had responded to that gospel. He just came from difficult times in Thessalonica and Philippi. If anything, he could have easily quit. But he came because God led him there. And he says, we're only going to take credit for our own labors. A number of years ago, a couple were, were leaving church on a Sunday morning. And I said to them, oh, how are you guys doing? And the, and the husband looked at me and said, well, what do you care? I said, oh, what happened here? And he said, I called the other night to talk, to share with you what was going on, and you never got back to me. I said, oh, I'm sorry. So what happened was she called late on a night Saturday night, I was already sleeping. My daughter answered the phone, talked to her, but she never told me he called. He assumed I blew it off. And so he was very upset with me and criticized me for that. And he didn't know the whole story either. So I apologized and sought to explain that and rectify the situation. Criticism. Hard to swallow. Hey, criticism is hard to swallow. Here's my sticky point. It's not really that... Uh, Creative. Very simply, it says no one is immune to criticism. No one is immune to criticism. Jesus Christ was criticized over and over and over by Jewish religious leaders. Sometimes he answered, sometimes he did not answer. Everybody's going to be criticized one time or another. Maybe it's at work, maybe it's in a home situation, maybe it's through extended family. So how do we, how do we handle that? How do we handle criticism? This is going to give you two very simple applications. First one is try to learn from it. Try to learn from it. Our initial reaction is to get upset about it, but the truth is what people say about us is never quite true. But it's never totally false either. It's like they hit the target, but maybe not the bullseye. And so anytime I face criticism, I also ask myself this question. Is there anything in here that is true that I need to understand and learn from, even if it wasn't given with the right motive? I got a note one time from a friend of mine, in ministry, uh, who challenged me and criticized me for something I'd said to someone else. And my initial reaction was, you know, you said worse things than that. But then I slowed down and said, you know, he's right. I need to learn from this. So first step is try 
to learn from criticism, even if it isn't given with the right motive. Um, and secondly, answer it when it's necessary. Answer it when it's necessary. Paul answered here because there's too much at stake. There's been times I've answered too because I wanted to straighten it up and get things right with the person who's criticizing. Let me also add, if you're the one doing the criticism, Rather than talk to other people and complain and criticize this person, go directly to the person and get the issue resolved. This may be something that is simply a misunderstanding. I did finish my supper that night in Alberta, but I did turn down seconds when they offered me more to eat. Remember, there's only one opinion. There's only one opinion that counts. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, my number one goal in life is to be pleasing unto the Lord. And then he says in verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And each one may give an account of what he's done in his body, whether good or worthless. Criticism is inevitable. No one's immune. But we can learn from criticism. And if you're the one doing the criticism, please. There's so many verses in the book of Proverbs that says about reckless words. Rather than criticize, Give the benefit of the doubt or go to the person. Explain your concern and get it resolved rather than talking to other people. That then turns into gossip. And there's many verses in Proverbs that talks about the evils of gossip. I went to uh, Columbia University in South Carolina a number of years ago to work on the doctor of ministry. The president at the time was Robertson McQuilkin, an amazing man. As a child, he dreamed of being the president of that school because his dad was the president of Columbia Bible College in Columbia, South Carolina. His dream came true. One day he did become the president of Columbia Bible College. And when he took that position, he sensed an affirmation and a powerful call from God. He served for many years as the president. He served with distinction. Then one day, this special man realized he had a tragedy on his hand. His wife began to show the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. This was no slow moving case. In fact, in a matter of months, there were dramatic consequences. She not only lost her memory of much of their life together, she was unable to even recognize him as her husband. So he made a decision. He resigned from his position of this dream job he'd always he'd wanted for his whole life to take care of his wife. And believe it or not, people criticized him. See, the realist who told him there was no point in doing what he was doing. Anyone could take care of his wife. Besides, he didn't even recognize him. Then there were the pious critics who brought up the fact that he was walking away from a calling from God. God called you to this. How can you walk away from that? Well, this was the case where he felt he needed to answer. And so to the first critics, he said, I realize he doesn't recognize me, but I still recognize her. To the other ones who criticized, he said, I, I realize that God called me to this job, but he said there's something even more important than the calling. That, he said, is a promise. He made a promise to take care of her till death. Criticism. No one's immune. We will all be criticized. The key is how we handle that criticism. Some needs answered, some does not need answered. Paul answered his critics here because he cared enough about the Corinthians to keep them from being deceived and led away from a sincere devotion to Christ. Again, if you're the one doing the criticism, please. Stop. If you have something concerned, go to the person directly. If you're the one being criticized, trust in the Lord to take care of that. Learn from it. And if it's not true, let that go and keep moving ahead. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for Paul's example. Uh, everybody I'm sure can identify as being criticized. I pray for folks right now who've been under severe criticism and are hurting deeply from it. I pray this message helps them deal with it in a proper way and learn from it as well. Lord, again, I pray your protection upon everyone who's listening and their families. I pray across our country, Lord. We are in so much 
disarray and, and divisiveness. I pray for unity in our country. I pray for revival in the lives of Christians. I pray for a powerful work of God to draw unsaved people to faith during this COVID-19. And Lord, we just trust you to work and, and want to remain faithful. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks.